Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Faith and Culture series with author and essayist Richard Rodriguez. Richard was one of our very first guests when we launched this series, and we're pleased to welcome him back for our conversation on the topic of the public self in the virtual present. And he is joined by Paul Eli, Senior Fellow at our Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, and our series moderator. And I'd like to express my gratitude to Paul for his efforts to curate our Faith and Culture series over these past 13 years. This series has enabled our community to engage with extraordinary artists and writers, filmmakers and thinkers and conversations that deepen our understanding of both faith and culture. And I wish to express our appreciation to all of our partners for today's event, the Berkeley Center, our Office of Mission and Ministry, our College Dean's Office, and our Center for Latin American Studies. This afternoon, we have the privilege of hearing from a writer who the Washington Post has called one of the most eloquent and probing public intellectuals in America. Through memoir, essays, and commentary on television and radio, Richard has explored a wide range of the complexities of American life. His essays, which have been published in the New York Times, Harper's Magazine, Mother Jones, and Time, offer in the words of one reviewer, a fierce, rigorous, ironic, and sincere cross-examination of both contemporary America and himself. In his first and widely acclaimed book, Hunger of Memory, The Education of Richard Rodriguez, Richard explored how language and schooling shaped his coming of age as a child of Mexican immigrants in the American educational system. That memoir became the first in a series of award-winning books in which Richard reflected on identity, religion, race, and culture in the United States. And these include Days of Obligation, An Argument with My Mexican Father, Brown, The Last Discovery of America, and Darling, A Spiritual Autobiography. In his 1992 book, Days of Obligation, it was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and earned Richard the National Humanities Medal, the highest honor that our government bestows in recognition of exemplary work in the humanities. Richard has also worked as an editor with the Pacific News Service for many years and received a Peabody Award for his thought-provoking visual essays on PBS NewsHour with Jim Lair, which explored aspects of American life from music and art to politics and history. Richard has defined the essay as, and I quote, the biography of an idea. So many of his essays have provided us with a deeper, richer understanding of the ideas we hold as a culture, the ones we inherit, and the ones we develop over the course of our lives. We're honored to have Richard here with us today and to join him in conversation I'm so pleased to have our moderator, Paul Eli. Paul is the author of The Life You Save May Be Your Own, which won the Penn Martha Albrand Award for First Nonfiction and Reinvent Reinventing Bach. His essays and articles have appeared in The Atlantic, The New York Times, Vanity Fair, Commonweal, The New Yorker. And prior to joining us at Georgetown, Paul worked in book publishing for many years as a senior editor with Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. I'm grateful to Paul for the curiosity, the inquiry, the joy he brings to our community and our faith and culture series. And I look forward to today's conversation. I'll now turn it over to Paul and Richard. Thank you very much, President DeJoya. It's really a pleasure to see you again on screen. And thank you to Richard Rodriguez for joining us for a second conversation in the Faith and Culture series. You were one of our first uh, conversation partners when the series got going in 2009. And to have you back uh, in a different moment with different insights, I can't think of anything better. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Paul. Before we begin our conversation, I'd like to thank the audience for tuning in via Zoom and also thank those who are joining us via Facebook Live. The event will be posted after it's recorded for later viewing. 
And after Richard and I have a, a moderated conversation, uh, we'll have a live Q&A with the Zoom audience. And in order to participate in that Q&A, you should submit a question through the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Please indicate whether you're a student at Georgetown, a faculty member, staff member, a member of the community, and we'll give priority to student questions. Keep an eye on the Q&A uh, part of the screen, and we'll let you know if you've been selected uh, to pose a question. You should be ready to ask it live on video. So thanks very much for that. Richard, uh, some years ago, you let me know that your birthday is the Feast of St. Ignatius. And so every year, July 31, is that right? That's right. Uh, the Feast of St. Ignatius rolls around, and I think about Ignatius of Loyola for a little bit. And then I um, think about your work and take 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 it down and, and read something that you've written. This year, I read for the umpteenth time, uh, Parts of Hunger of Memory, a book that's meant so much to me over the decades. And this year, I also was preparing for an Ignatius seminar at Georgetown. That's a first year seminar, small group, which is meant to build community through a shared intellectual endeavor. And the endeavor in this course is to read nonfiction narratives of the search, personal search from recent decades and uh, we read Hunger of Memory together. So when I reread it to prep for the course, I was thinking about our moment. Black Lives Matter came to mind, but also in the way that literature speaks across time and speaks to topics in ways that neither author or reader could anticipate, uh, the book spoke to the circumstances of the pandemic because uh, Hunger of Memory is so much a book about uh, the private self and the public self. And those categories have been so complicated by the pandemic. Is that, um, have you thought about the pandemic yourself in those terms? Uh, not, in a way I have, I, I've always been a very private person. And even when I was in a classroom, for all the years I was in a classroom from grammar school to college to universities, I, I kept secrets. And I lived a lot of my intellectual life away from the classroom. That is, I, pre, I went to lectures in the city that, that, that other students weren't at. I went, I saw things that other students weren't at. And I didn't go to junior prom because I was a gay student. And I, I made my own way in the city of ideas. Um, I was watching uh, Malcolm X when my classmates were uh, dancing for their junior prom. So a, a, lot, of my, a lot of my intellectual life was, was venturing out in the city. Uh, but also must, I must say, that the intensity of that of, of my early life was in private. And so um, I have a, a, a sympathy for people who, whether it's Thoreau or Wittgenstein, who, who for various periods of time will go to a, to a private space in order to write. I have a great sympathy for that. Some, some years ago, I, you know, I was reading Malcolm, uh, 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 Martin Luther King Jr.'s essay, uh, Letter from a Birmingham Prison. And I thought, you know, you can't write an essay of that density unless you are separated from, 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 the, from the human experience of being free. That, that entrapment or imprisonment sometimes is the liberation for the, for the mind. Which le leads me to first ask you, as I recall, you went to see Saroyan once in San Francisco, is that right? That's right. And so what, what was it like as a, I guess, a teenager for you to then encounter a real live author? And what did it mean for you to come out of your private encounter with him and see him in public? Well, you know, the, the one develops through the page a relationship to writers and then finds out later in life that many times they're not the same person at all. Um, you, when, you, when you raised a copy of my book, the better paperback edition of Hunger of Memory, I, the truth is that I had not read that book since I wrote it uh, because I'm afraid of that book. I'm afraid that it's better than I can achieve now, that the essays, that you begin as a writer to fight against your own, your own achievement. Um, there was a clarity of the writing in that young man's voice that now has turned Baroque and dense and, and pleased with complexity. That's not, I'm not that same person. That young man released me. When I meet young students who have ideas percolating, I always tell them, write them now. Don't wait until you become 30 or 40 or 50 years old, because by that time you'll turn into Richard Rodriguez. You won't be able to, you won't be able to write it. You'll turn, you'll turn dark and Baroque and, and, and without the clarity of youth. So that um, when I remember in London, I, 
this is this is not to avoid your question about Saroy, but it is to avoid the question of Saroy. <laughs> I was I was meeting I met at a dinner at a dinner party in Kensington, this one of the heroes of my reading life, and by that time this was many years after he had written the book, that I so admired. I went up to him and and like a lot of Englishmen of his age, hair was coming out of his ears and out of his nose. His eyebrows were this explosion of hair, and I tenderly went up, you know, twenty-two year old man to tell him how much I admired his book. And he looked at me and he said, not a day has gone by, he said, that I've not regretted that book, he said. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I thought, you know, you bastard to do that to yourself. I will never do that to myself. I will never turn against myself. But I, but, uh, but I, I realize now that writers in their progress are often not the writer who, who, created, who created the beautiful sentence. The writer in its progress uh, becomes arthritic or becomes bitter or becomes lonely or, or is battered by life. Uh, that's as true of the reader as it is of the writer. So Ryan, the man I met in San Francisco, was not the man I fell in love with years ago in high school. He was a different man. He was a beaten man. He was a bitter man and he wondered about my uh, intrusion into his privacy. It's pretty striking to hear you say you haven't read your first book because I've just had the really remarkably rich experience of seeing um, 15 students in their late teens read the book for the first time and encounter you through that book and then invite them to come and encounter you this way yeah. and uh, and to match the, uh, the the self on Zoom with the self on the page and, and see where the two meet. Yeah, well, look at the cover of the book and you realize that the difference between, that's 40 years, you know, my parents have died in those 40 years. I've moved on. I've been with my partner now for 40 years. I've been disappointed. I've been exhilarated by life. I've traveled. Uh, that young man that stares at you from the cover of that book is not the face, this, this, face, this man who is now 76 years old. Uh, that's, you know, that time is real. And to expect a writer to remain the writer that he was or she was uh, years ago is, I think, um, impractical. I, I think you've done as good a job of um, updating your work and keeping yourself fresh as anyone as I can think of. You know, youth has its sappy wisdom, you said somewhere. Yes, yes. And the paradox is that when you were young, you felt like an older a, a man out of time in a way, older than your years. Yes. And, now, uh, and now time is running in the opposite direction, I suppose. I, I take more chances now as an older man. I, my, my writing is much more uh, experimental and, and uh, playful. Um, but the, the, the young man had his own wisdom. Uh, there, there is to every season this, this possibility. Um, and if you have a song in you, I'm telling you, and you're 18 or 19 or 20 years old, write that song now because it will not be there next year. It will die within you. You will have a different song maybe, but it won't be that song. Don't postpone your creativity. That, that young man who wrote Hunger of Memory, um, uh, knew enough about his ideas, which had been with him since he was embarrassed by his parents growing up, embarrassed by their lack of education, had come home and, and, and was forced to make a choice, the great bilingualism of his life between the public language of the classroom and the private language of home. And um, that, that experience he'd been with him since when he was six or seven years old. When he finally wrote it in his 20s and 30s, that was that was at the very end of that experience. I would not have been able to write it any any far, any longer in my life. Do you do you think the um, typology that you just named between the private language of home and the public language of self um, has been upended by the experience that we're having in the pandemic, where we're trying to conduct public lives and fashion public selves from home? Well, you know, I I, I before this pandemic, I used to go to universities. Um, and, uh, and invariably, there would be what I call the, uh, the, St the Steve Jobs section of the audience, where students would be clearly looking at their laptops while I was speaking. And you'd see the little glow from, from their seats. <laughs> I, I have a friend who is, is the wife of a Supreme Court justice. I won't mention his name. And she, she went to a lecture that he was giving at a large uh, Midwestern University law school at the large Midwestern University. And she sat him back. 
the students weren't even aware that she was there. And of course she watched this, the, the law schools allowed these laptops with the premise that they were taking, students were taking notes and, 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 and looking up cases that the judge might have referred to. Well, in fact, what she noticed was that they were in fact uh, watching videos, uh, uh, sometimes pornographic. They were playing games, uh, video games. They, uh, they were little monsters flying across the screen. And she realized that, you know, <laughs> this, 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 this inability to be in the moment is much longer than, than, than Zoom. I mean, it's, it's part of our time. I, I did an essay in the New York Times about oh, what, six years ago called uh, Nakedness in a Digital Age in which I, I described walking uh, behind a naked man in San Francisco. He was walking a few blocks away from my house. And I wanted to know, he had put sp sparkle dust all over his, his, his face. It was for his, intentional his, exhibition. That's right. Yeah. And I, I wondered where he was going. Um, so I went down the street behind him. He was about my age, uh, trimmer in figure than I am. And uh, the interesting thing was all these young people went by with their cell phones and none of them bothered to look at him. He, he walked all the way to Market Street and finally some Japanese tourists, some young teenage girls started giggling and giggling and wanted pictures with him, with their cell phones, of course. But um, it's a, it, it is really shocking how disconnected we are from our bodies now. And that, that precedes Zoom. On the other hand, I don't think education truly can, can proceed without the body. That is, we are in our bodies, even when our bodies don't work. It, the, the, the drama of being within, a, within our bodies is part of what it means to be learned. So what do you specifically notice as the diminution of life uh, in this moment where we're not encountering each other body to body, face to face in the same way? Well, I mean, partly growing old, you don't, ex you don't experience very many people. I, 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 um, I'm careful with my mask on, but I go through a park across the street on my way on my morning walk. And there are all these young people running up and down the stairs. I want to tell them that I used to run up and down the stairs until the, you know, the, the concrete was, was too, was too uh, violent on, against my knees. But I don't want to, I don't tell them, run and run, run down, uh, ruin your knees. See, this is the, the lesson for every generation. <laughs> they're, they're lifting weights over their head as they, as they run up the, the stairs. Um, they don't, they, I'm, I don't exist for them. Uh, that's the drama of youth, you know, that, uh, that, that, that um, they're free of, of the old man watching. And on the other hand, I'm free to watch them as I climb the stairs. I could collapse and maybe one somebody would notice, but, uh, but by and large, the, 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 the loneliness of our, of our times is nothing if, if, except more of the drama of our lives. Um, I, I, years ago, I got a letter from a man in prison. He was a bank robber and he had seen me on, pu on public television because at the prison that he was at, he was a, they were allowed only to watch the, the public television channel. That was their punishment. They had to watch Sesame Street and the news hour. <laughs> and you can see all these murderers watching the news hour every night. But anyway, he saw me and he wanted to have a, a, a relationship of some kind of, in, in letters with me. And I didn't want to start this conversation with this bank robber. He robbed about 10, 15, 20 banks. But I also believe that, that, you know, I said, if as long as we don't talk about sex, because I don't have any sexual fantasies about men behind bars, and as long as you don't tell me anything that I need to report to the police, we can have this conversation. Well, for three years, he would write me with his tiny little script, because most of the time he was in, in solitary. And because he was in solitary, there is an energy to these letters. Uh, I'm telling you, if, you, if you're watching this, uh, this exchange in a private space at home, do not use that private space as an excuse not to write, but realize its possibility. Within that private space, this bank robber would write me these, these weekly letters about Russian novels, about Irish poetry, about violence and men, why men are more violent than women, about, about what it is like to, to rob a bank, and uh, the experience of driving down uh, to rob a bank on Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles and being so nervous that the only thing he could do would be to pull aside the car to the side of the road and fall asleep. 
his 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 anxiety was such a at such a pit. Well, I would get these letters. It was like getting letters from the 18th century. Do not tell me that because you are isolated, because you are in a room right now, that you cannot tell each other, you cannot tell yourself things of significance. That is the very place where you go to tell yourself things of significance. If you think it's going to take place in a frat house with people, I was at a, at a, a residential college at, at Yale on a Saturday night, they put me in residence overnight. And it was like living in, in, in this, you know, this, this, this mad house of, of people were jumping up and down at like at three in the morning. And they surely were not reading Shakespeare. They were, <laughs> <laughs> they were, they were completely mad. I remember when I was at Stanford, this man who became the head of a medical uh, school used to run down, this is usually on Thursday nights, in this tiny bikini with this machete, he would run down the hallway. Um, and I thought, you know, that's part of the experience of going to college, but that is not the, you know, that's, that is not where one learns. Uh, <laughs> that's where one experiences youth and its wildness. I guess what I'm hearing uh, from this, apart from the, you know, the energy of your storytelling, which runs so against the, what you prepared us for, which is uh, s someone who's broke and, 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 weary weary of words is not obviously not the case but what i hear you saying is in one sense um this moment we're in has just made manifest a lot of the loneliness that's been introduced into our lives by technology but then on the other that it's offering an opportunity for solitude that's there to be seized if if uh if we're willing to um uh, turn off the video screen and 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 take it take it yeah I, the excuse of, of loneliness is, not, is, is, is insufficient because too many writers have found themselves within loneliness, while either in prison, um, in, 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 in situations where there was, they're literally writing novels on toilet paper because of the poverty of their lives. Too many writers have, have found themselves alone and work within that, that, that solitude to create poetry and majesty and, and epic vision. Uh, to use that as an excuse at, at, at Georgetown is, I think, lazy. Oh, I wouldn't, I, I'll take responsibility for that one. I wouldn't put it on Georgetown. <laughs> I'm just thinking about how, uh, and I've discussed this with students, the, the, the act of going out of the, the place that is home where you dress the way you'd like and speak in the lingua franca of home and um, in some sense, uh, behave in a common ways with others with common expectations is such the drama not only of your first book but of subsequent books and i'm thinking of the person who who's the age that you were then who is now um, not venturing out uh school is taking place on zoom the uh act of uh, fashioning a public self is, is happening through events like this one and what what's that um what's that person's public self going to look like you know, when he's 30. Well, I, 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 I keep crediting the Sisters of Mercy who were my first teachers with the moment of my, of my, the dawning awareness of my public self. When the nun says to me, almost the first day of school, uh, she writes my name on the, on the school board and she says, my name is Richard Rodriguez. And she, and she, she tells me to, to repeat it after her. And in, in this, these are the words she uses in a loud and clear voice. So all the boys and girls can hear you. Well, at that moment, she's asking me to use language to, and speak to strangers, boys and girls, people I don't know. Use a, pitch my voice as I'm pitching my voice to you now, precisely because we are among, among, among strangers. Well, that, that, that idea of myself takes form in the classroom at the age of about six. And it's, it's, the, it's the reason why 10 years later, I'm reading a Russian novel, because then by that time, I'm part of the, the public life. I don't need to put on a suit or I don't need to put on a sweater in order to read War and Peace. Already, I, I'm, I'm participating in a larger vision of myself connected to strangers. I'm, collected, I'm connected to Russian history. I'm collected, connected to, 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 to Russian novels by the act of reading. I'm not simply write, living and writing within my own cocoon. That act of, 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 the, of the larger self is an act of the imagination. It's not necessarily an act of dress. Although I, I, I must tell you, I, I went to a Jesuit school in Los Angeles recently, and the students come in with in such undress. There was 
<laughs> and the Jesuit said, oh, you get used to it, he said, <laughs> noticing my, my large eyes. These, these, these people came in with shorts so short that, that you know, it was like some kind of striptease act. Uh, and the boys in this kind of uh, disheveled t-shirt, and nobody was, nobody was dressed to learn. And, and I think sometimes we fool ourselves by just um, how disheveled our society has become. Um, to read a Russian novel, you don't have to wear a suit, but it, it helps you, I think, to talk about a Russian novel if you go to a classroom wearing a, a sweater and, a, and jeans um, and not wearing shorts that open up on the side. Um, I, told, I would have told the students if, I had, if they'd been my students, but this Jesuit, Alan Dick, uh, Dick told me, oh, don't worry. He said, that's just the way they are in Los Angeles. So do you think, is there any possibility that when we come out of this, the um, relish that we'll have for public life and for dressing and for uh, having a night out and seeing each other face to face will be more intense than it might have been? And that some of the, some of the casualness that you've described will be arrested by the, the fact that we've all had to um, wear pajamas for six months? <laughs> I don't, you know, a lot of writers wear pajamas when they write their novels. <laughs> That's the secret. Uh, or even less dressed when they're writing their novels. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll go through a phase where we'll all get dressed up when we go out. But I, I see, you know, going down the street around, this is California, but people are running down the street in the middle of the street, um, you know, uh, without much formality to them. Uh, and I don't think you can get much more informal than they already are. Um, they, I think the people feel an intensity of wanting to be out and about. And, and the park is filled on the weekends with, with picnics already. All these young people who think they will not die are already having picnics. Um, it's, it's, death is, is an idea that comes with a, a shock to young people. So um, they're already cheating. You wrote what, I'm not alone in this, what many of us think is one of the great works of art about um, the last epidemic, the AIDS epidemic. The essay brings so much into a small space, but uh, the evocation of a community of mutual aid emerging in, in the midst of, of mutual need is so powerful in that essay. That's the wish of, that was the, what Pope Francis called for in that dark night in uh, St. Peter's Square, that somehow we would come out of the pandemic with a greater sense of the ties that bind and, and of our reciprocal obligations to one another. Uh, what do you what are you seeing? Well, I, I, the essay that you refer to is an essay called Lake, Lake Victorians, and it's about the AIDS epidemic in San Francisco. Whereas the phone here up by my by my computer would ring uh, with re regularity with the news that a friend of mine was ill, had just tested positive for AIDS or HIV, uh, or that a friend had died. It became so common that one hesitated sometimes to, to answer the phone. Death was that common a, a, a companion. Nonetheless, what, what the experience that, that you describe, um, partly because I'm a Catholic and I believe that suffering within Catholicism is the great intuition of the human experience. Suffering is at the center of human experience. Indeed, at the, at the center of the altar is the crucified Christ who hangs there even on Easter Sunday. He's Christ is still hanging. It's it's Good Friday every day of the of the, of the year for Catholics. That that what what uh, I discovered, of course, because because uh, AIDS was a, was not like this current epidemic. You could watch. You could sit with the dying. Uh, you could hold their hands. You could assure them. You could you could you could brush their their face um, because there was that proximity to death. You could even kiss death. Um, the, the the current epidemic, which is so violent in its, in its destruction of consolation, um, where, where children are not allowed to, to see their parents die, except by Zoom or how it, however it's done, or, or through a window. You know, can, um, this is a very different experience of death, uh, where you're not allowed to touch death, and you're not allowed to, to hold its hand. Um, the, the experience of AIDS was one of those physical experiences of my life, partly because so many friends of mine particularly the, the most beautiful friends who had had a very, very active sex life uh, turned into these monstrous caricatures 
at the end of their lives. And um, a man without legs, uh, one of the last things he says to me, this is when he wizened, Catholic, uh, devout, the devout Catholic, he said, you would never have thought that I was once a beauty, a beauty, he says, um, and then he dies. Um, it was it was just different. You could touch that. Uh, it just felt it, and and you you felt suffering was something that you could participate in in that way. Um, this feels very different. We we leave to the nurses and the doctors and these people with their masks most of the the, the hands on experience of suffering. I uh, live in a part of Brooklyn where there's a small bicycle shop near the expressway, and the place was closed for a few days. And I went there with a flat tire and I saw the um, proprietor, the only the one man shop raising the gate. And I thought, oh, good, you're opening again. I can get my uh, tire fixed. Uh, his son had died of um, the coronavirus uh, and at the age 34 and he closed the shop for a few days. And we cried together on the side of the street with the cars roaring on the expressway over overhead. The person I had um, swap pleasantries with while he was working on my bicycle over the years, but just, I think I was the first person that he'd seen since he'd um, come out of, of death, really. And I've seen him half a dozen times since, and I, I feel so grateful for the chance to be real. It's, it's that experience that has kept this pandemic from being an abstraction that, it, that it's been rendered in so many ways, not just the fact that Zoom is um, the way people see the dying, but you mentioned earlier, you feel as an older person invisible, and the um, the the fact that the um, epidemic has um, struck so many elderly people has it's compounded that invisibility. Is uh, is it fair to say that? Yeah, I think that that's true. Um, and when it's filled with a sense that uh, it it is it uh, you know my I I don't know death through this epidemic the way I knew death through AIDS. Uh, AIDS was really proximate and uh, there were just 30, 40, 50 people I knew who, who died. And so it was that experience of the, of the, of the man with the, with the bicycle tire compounded by that many. Um, there were days when you felt rather like a, you'd come back to London after World War I and the city was still moving. The lights were, the street lights were still going on. The crowds were coming in and out of stores, but you had tasted death, you had smelled it, you had held its hand, you had kissed it, and nothing would be the same. And when I talk about the difference in my, my writing life is that uh, the, the, the young man who wrote Hunger and Memory is not the older man 10 years later who wrote uh, Late Victorians and who knows death, the death of so many beautiful men. Um, that man is, 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 has, was changed by death, by bedpans. In, in, in quite a different way. One of the important, uh, um, another typology in your work is between Mexicanism, excuse me, pessimism, which you associate with uh, Mexican inheritance with Catholicism and American optimism coming from the East Coast and the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, it feels to me sometimes that in this pandemic, we, we're just being um, so inundated with false optimism that uh, um, death practically can't be heard and the way that um, that you've given voice to in your work. Yeah, Octavio Paz, the great writer, a poet of Mexico once said that the two great um, mystic countries of the world, the two countries that understand mysticism most are Russia and Mexico. <laughs> and it is the fate of Mexico to be the neighbor of the United States, of course. Uh, we are probably the least mystical of countries. <laughs> Idealistic maybe, but not mystical. We. There is something in the American optimism that I, I deeply admire. Uh, and it's, it's, it's certainly against my father's pessimism. It was something that I held on to, that I could, that I could make something of myself in this world, that, that it would not come to disappointment in, in quite the way he knew. And he always called me at the end, toward the end of his life, how lucky I was, he, lucky boy, he called me. Um, and it was true. America gave us things that, that, that Mexico would not have given me. I would never have been on television in Mexico unless I was a clown on a Mexican telenovela. Mexicans who look like me are normally clowns on a soap opera. You would not be a, on a newsreader. They'd, they'd use a, a white Mexican for that. Um, 
so what my father knew as a Mexican, as an American, I also knew that, this, that there was something changed in this country. What my father knew too was, of course, it's that death would catch you in the end. And, um, and in the end, you would grow old. And in the end, there would be disappointment. And, um, and he asked, you know, at the end of his life to, um, for me to take him to mass. He was 90, 99 years old and it was raining. And um, so I took him to the Irish parish and the old Irish men, women came out with their umbrellas to take him into church. And, and the air was so dense with, 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 with damp that it went into his lungs. I told him if he went out, he would get pneumonia. And he said in Spanish, roughly to me, he said, what do I care? He said, what do I care? Get pneumonia. He said, do you think I'm afraid of dying? He said, this was a Mexican talking to his American son and he died in a week. In this moment, we're, we're not in church the way we typically would be. Church is a liminal space in your work between public and private selves. It's a place where death can be discussed uh, freely in, in ways that aren't um, so common outside of church. What, uh, what does it mean that the churches are um, uh, so restricted in this moment that we, we're not um, having that experience together? Well, we, you know, my parish, they Zoom their masses and, and you can watch the mass on Zoom and realize how in, insufficient that is. Uh, but lately we have been able to have communion. And for the first time in my experience as a Catholic, I knew hunger like I've never known it before. I've hungered for the host. Um, I have not uh, had the experience of drinking the wine at church, but the, the taste of, 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 the, of the host the taste of Christ on my on my in my mouth has been sublime, and and for that you know that it was the period of hunger that that allowed for this the celebration. It doesn't. It comes to me now without any sense of the routine. This is a gift that it comes to me um, with, with as a taste, as something that that I that I swallow. It's so powerful to hear. I I know my own experience going to mass is just a feeling of gratitude to be there that somehow I belong there but the first time I went back after some months away because of the pandemic it was a very strong feeling of um, a magnetic uh, attraction or something that I had been pulled there and was being held there by something larger than habit I suppose yeah well remember though that in the altar boy that I was um, on on Holy Saturday uh, after the Easter vigil was finished and I was given the task of lighting these these rows of candles and and suddenly the the the, the altar was ablaze with light and um, and it was it was soon to be the Easter midnight mass and I looked up and I saw Christ on the cross and I realized that nothing had changed we were still within time that it would always be Good Friday even with the assurance of Easter Christ would always be suffering. And we would, as Christians, be suffering with him. Well, that that comes with <laughs> with some force for the fourteen-year-old with these <laughs> lighting the candles. You know that that um, the, these lessons are not are not made irrelevant by this period in our our American life. It, our, what shall I say? The, the world suffers with us. This epidemic. This is and and now all ages die, as you suggest. Fathers bury sons. Uh, sons bury their grandparents and so forth, um, and it's not simply gays or or, or or drug addicts who are dying on the street, but it's everyone is 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 a possible victim. This is a very holy moment. We'll go to questions from the audience in just a moment, but a holy moment. Can you think of a? Is there? A, has it taken any concrete expression? Have you seen any art or read anything or heard anything that? that um, feels uh, like it's um, taking the temper of this, this moment in, in the way that you just, just did for us? And then we'll go to questions from the audience. Um, no, there's, there hasn't been that moment for me, uh, except sitting in the pew after taking communion and realizing that, I was, I, that, the, that the host was in my mouth and that I was eating in a public space again, the church. Um, and that I was allowed this, this great mystery. Not since the man upstairs had died and he'd been, um, 
had a difficult relationship to the Catholic Church. And at the end of his life, he took communion in his bed, arranged by a parish priest who came by. And I saw him without teeth munching on the host. And um, at that moment in church a few weeks ago, when I took after three or four or five months, the, my, my first communion, using that phrase we used to use in, at, at seven, the age of seven, um, it was a it was a triumphant moment of survival through through plague. It, it's so rich to hear, and I figure I'll be reading it. I hope I will. <laughs> the first question is from Savannah Jones, who will join us on screen. Savannah, just a reminder: Can you introduce yourself? Uh, what uh, school you're in at Georgetown? What um, uh, where you're where you're watching this from, and so forth. Um, yeah, so first of all, thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. Um, my name is Savannah Jones. I'm right now I'm a freshman in Georgetown College and I'm joining from Virginia just outside of DC. Um, my question is sort of in regards to your work in more of a broader sense, I guess. Um, the ending of hunger of memory implies this sort of continued search to regain a sense of privacy in your life. So I was wondering how you feel that you explored this in your subsequent works and also the way that your success as a writer and the publicity that accompanied that um, impacted your ability to reconnect with privacy in your life. Well, I, th I think, Savannah, thank you for the question. I think the writing act is ultimately private. And by writing that, writing the book was, was after, after my mother had asked me not to write that book uh, and had sent me a letter in which she asked me not to write the book. And then including the letter in the book was this, this act of willful misbehavior by, by the son saying to his mother, but this is my life to, that I need to write about. This is my, my story. And that I need to write to a stranger. As I say in the last chapter of that book, there are things I can tell a stranger that I will not tell anybody that I know, any, any, any friend or relative. I can talk to Savannah because your face will disappear from the screen. But, but within this moment of exchange, we can exchange, you can read your poetry to me with the way you cannot read it to your best friend. Because I, I have no, I will not, I will not, I will not smirk when, when you read to me uh, because that's the, the, the freedom of our privacy. Thank you, Richard. Our next question is from Robert McDonald. Uh, just, Robert, just please remind us uh, where you're from and what program you're in and so forth. Hi. Um, again, you know, I'd also like to thank both of you, uh, Paul and Mr. Rodriguez, for today. I'm actually not a Georgetown student. I'm currently doing my PhD with the Claremont School of Theology at Willamette University. I'm in the dissertation and exam phase. So I'm actually down in Richmond, Virginia right now. Um, my question is connected to something you said early on, Mr. Rodriguez. You know, being in my early 30s, I can definitely say that I've had plenty of ideas and creative impulses that have just slipped off into the ether, if you will. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts or suggestions on how someone could maybe try to rediscover those or maybe re, uh, renew their impulse, that impulse, as I'm sure you've had the experience of over the years. Yeah, I, by, by and large, I'll tell you what, what any writer will tell you. And that is, you should probably keep a journal or keep notes to yourself. You should treat yourself as a stranger. Yes, there you are. You should you should write in our language to yourself, and try to render uh, this, this these these odd or vague ideas as as sentences that that you can again re refer to. Um, that's 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 one way. Uh, the, the 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 other way is that I also believe that that ideas don't simply disappear; that they're part of. They're part of the air that, that's made you uh, who you are. And that ideas that I thought I had long given up come rushing back 20 years later, if that's any consolation. Uh, the mind is a, a very curious tool. And many times it will give you things that you think that you, that you don't know, that, you, that, you, that you've forgotten. 
I had a professor in graduate school who said that trusting the memory was one of the acts of adulthood. <laughs> the memory would do some of the sifting and the unimportant stuff would drop off and the stuff yeah. you remembered was what was significant. <laughs> that, was, that was a great release. It's also that, that you know that we, we know we hear things at a certain age, but it's, you know, it's not until we're in the trenches fighting World War I that that idea comes back to us or that we're that that, that suddenly we're you know we're facing uh, uh, the death of a, our best friend. That 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 that's something that we that, that we heard or, or or wrote about or thought about years ago, but hadn't thought again. It's it's then that ideas come back. That, that the, the memory says you already know this. You have forgotten it, but you knew this once upon a time. You knew these things, and here they are again. Thank you, Richard. Our, our next question is from Robin Moore. Hello. Uh, I'm. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, hear this uh, dialogue this afternoon. I'm Robin Moore. I uh, was a student at the School of Foreign Service in the class of 1991. Uh, I'm calling uh, from my home in Philadelphia, where I'm uh, working these days for the Religious Society of Friends. But I actually wanted to ask, um, what is something illuminating that you have read during this pandemic uh, either in the English or Spanish, um, and if you whether that your experience of what you are led to read has changed because of the pandemic, or if you think that the lack of publicity of book tours is changing what books are finding audiences these days. Well, my writing, my reading life hasn't changed su substantially. The the thing about, but but I'm going through a depression right now, a, a minor sort but a real one because I've lost a sense of my audience. And so I'm not writing very much. And most of the magazines I used to work for don't exist anymore. Uh, many of the, the, the opportunities to, to give lectures and to talk to students, they're all gone now. And so my, my writing, my reading life is going into a different, different phase. I can read anything I want. And so I'm, I read Andy, a book of, about Andy Warhol one day or I'll read a book about Faulkner the next day. Um, I, don't, I don't go to literature for specific answers to, to, to preconceived questions. I used to go to literature to be surprised. I, I didn't know that I needed that book because I thought that I was, I, I, didn't, know that I, I didn't know that I needed to think about Andy Warhol right now. Um, but, I, but suddenly I, the sight of his body wrecked, wrecked with, um, with, with um, scars from has been nearly killed by a mad woman. Suddenly that, that is useful for me. Thank you. And I, I'm reading that book as well, Richard, and <laughs> ready to discuss it with you. The next uh, um, person to pose the question is Olivia French. Olivia? Hi, Olivia. Hi, um, thank you for being here today. My name is Olivia. I am a freshman in the Georgetown College and I'm tuning in from Boston right now. So earlier you spoke of the importance for young writers to capture their ideas as it, um, they may disappear or become less clear older in age. And so my question is, what is your advice for young uh, writers who may have these ideas for certain stories, but not necessarily the skill needed to put them to paper? And so, yeah. I would, I, I, I would write them. Um, and remind you, remind you that, that the skill comes with practice, but that idea or the experience that you're thinking about right now is, is if it's valuable enough to, to be on your, on, in, your, in, your, in your mind, you must write it out in some way. It may, it may tell you that it doesn't wanna be an essay. It, doesn't, it wants to be a story, or the story may tell you, I don't wanna be a story, I wanna be a play, or I wanna be a song. That, that you should be in concert or relationship to your own work so that it's, it begins to define itself and teach you about what it is, what it wants to be. But in order to, for that to happen, you have to start writing it out. It's called a rough draft. And <laughs> writers but really don't believe in rough drafts, but you cannot write any other way. You have to write in stages. Thank you. Our next question is from Dan Sachs. Dan? These are wonderful students of yours, by the way. Hi, Mr. Rodriguez. My name is Dan Sachs. 
um, and I'm a first year in the college, uh, calling in from Cupertino, California. Oh, um, nearby. Yeah, nearby, yeah. So you start your essay um, in Days of Obligation on India by saying that you used to stare at yourself in the mirror. And that kind of alienation was very interesting to hear as the start. Um, and so I'm interested, how has your Mexican American or your Catholic identity changed since your youth, given the various political movements, changes in immigration to the US, and all of these different things that have happened in your personal life? Well, that's really interesting. And, and partly because, you know, Mexico has come closer and closer to me. It surrounds me. Uh, I actually had to ask my landlord uh, not to do construction next, during this hour so we could have this conversation. But the room is filled next door with construction workers, all of whom speak Spanish, and the radio is on to uh, the to, to various of the radio stations. Um, so Mexico is very close to me right now, um, but um, uh, I don't look at myself in the mirror in the same way. In fact, the other day, I know we're not supposed to say the N word, so I won't say the N word. But I was walking through a a, a, a black part of San Francisco with my mask on, and this man comes by must be about 38. And I guess he thought I was black because he says, hi, N, he says to me. And I, I, I waved to him too. Um, that that um, my, my face doesn't mean anything anymore in quite the same way. In Cupertino, I could probably pass for Indian, which is what my uncle was from India. Um, I could pass for Filipino now. The world has so many faces like this. This, is, this face is common as mud. So I, 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 and if I go to Mexico, um, I always thought of this as an Indian face, but Mexico tells me that I'm not Indian. Um, it tells me that I'm mestizo, which is something quite different, um, albeit not white. Thank you. Our last question from the audience will be from Jose Madrid. Jose? Hello, and thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Rodriguez. It's quite an honor to be able to uh, speak to you directly. I read your work back in 2006 as a high school student, and it was the first time I was able to recognize myself in literature. My question to you is, you mentioned at the beginning that the Richard Rodriguez who looked from, at us from your uh, book cover is not the same Richard Rodriguez that looks at us today. And I wonder if the Richard Rodriguez of today um, take some of the same stances that you took before um, that drew criticism to your work from the Mexican American community, like your stance on bilingual education and on affirmative action. Uh, most of my opinions have stayed the same. That is, I haven't, my, my position on bilingual education was never what my critics thought it was. It was never about Spanish. It was about the necessity of using public language that bilingualism for me is a difference between speaking public language and private language and how a student who comes to the classroom has to learn to speak publicly. That, that is, that's the drama of education for me. I'm not, you, whether that's, that would be true if I was in, Me in Mexico City, uh, the language I would speak in the classroom would not be family language. It would be, it would be public Spanish, very different. It would be addressed to a stranger. Uh, as to affirmative action, it's too complicated to say, but I still think we are confused about the, who is a minority in our society. And um, if you think I'm a minority, if you think a man like me is entitled to the benefits of affirmative action, think again. I'm a middle-class man with certain freedoms given to middle-class Americans. And there are many people in our society much less advantaged, but because of them, because there are so many of them, I become, as I ascend the ladder of success, I become a minority to America, but it's a, it's a complete it, it's a complete misnomer. Um, they're the minorities, and they allow me by their number to be misclassified as a minority. I'm not a minority. I live within the assurance that I live as a Sisters of Mercy told me, with boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen. I live as a public person. I do not have a minority sense of myself. Can I say just one last thing? Um, uh, that the that quite early in my life, because I started reading D. H. Lawrence, uh, the coal miner's son in England, uh, that I that I was aware that white kids in America, poor white kids, Appalachian white kids, are 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 more minority than any of us dare to say, 
And the idea that there's only certain groups of us color charted, that this, this is a minority, this color of brown is a minority, is ludicrous. Um, the fact is that, that white is a minority too, when it's Appalachian white skin. Um, and that the, the we have ignored so many people in this society with our categories of suffering and allowed some people to be seen as minorities and ignored the, 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 the deprivation and the separation of others uh, in the process. I think that this election is, is showing us that you cannot let large portions of the population feel that they are being ignored and that their suffering is being ignored while you advance your own. And you advance Richard Rodriguez as somehow the majority, the minority. Richard Rodriguez is not the minority. Richard, to hear you say that again reminds me of, I guess our, my first encounter with Hunger of Memory, you have early in the book a kind of slick editor who says, why are you so stuck on these issues? Let's have more grandma. But <laughs> what you're saying now and the continued pertinence of, of those obsessions, uh, 40 years on shows that, that you were right all along <laughs> to stick with them. Thank you for doing so. And thank you for doing so kind of live and all over again for us here today. I'm so grateful to know you, to read you, to speak with you, and um, to be able to share this conversation with the public. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. You'll always be a friend. I really appreciate hearing that. Likewise, for those of you who are watching, if you'd like to um, um, pick up the video of this, it should be on Facebook and circulated through the Berkeley Center shortly. Thanks again to President DeJoya, to all my colleagues at the Berkeley Center who helped host, to our um, co-sponsors and partners, and to the audience. Thank you very much.